we're now going to be talking about recognizing and managing venous occlusive disease in affected and at-risk patient populations. Uh, and it's such an honor today to bring up here uh, Dr. Fossil. Dr. Fossil is at the Indiana University of Health. Uh, he is chair of the Hoosier Cancer Research Network in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Fossil received his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy as well as his Doctorate in Pharmacy from the Albany College of Pharmacy before completing an ASHP residency at the Samuel Stratton VA Medical Center. Most of you are well aware of Dr. Fossil's accomplishments, highly published in the oncology literature, especially with salvage chemotherapy, germ cell cancers, and so forth. So without further ado, Dr. Fossil. Thank you, Randy. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. I don't have any disclosures. We're going to talk about a rare disease called hepatic veno-occlusive disease. It also has another name called sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. So it's referred to either as VOD or SOS. You can call it either one. Uh, most people still call it VOD because it's been called that for a long, long time. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible complication of most commonly hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, both in adults and kids. I'm going to review a little bit about this disease and why it occurs, and then I'm going to talk about some of the historical treatment options and then a newer treatment option. Hepatic veno occlusive disease, as I mentioned, it is also referred to as sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. It is a life-threatening complication of hematopoietic stem cell transplant, more commonly allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. It doesn't occur all that often, but when it does, it's bad. So it may occur in upwards of 10 to 15 percent of patients. And there are some risk factors, which I'll get into as to why this can occur more frequently in certain patient groups. Now, just by way of review, uh, I'm sure that most people here don't do bone marrow transplant on a daily basis, so I'll give you a little bit of a thumbnail sketch as to what goes on with these patients. Uh, first, you have a patient that has either a very bad cancer or a rare immunologic disorder that is amenable to treatment with hematopoietic stem cell transplant, such as aplastic anemia. That patient, number one, you've got to confirm that the patient has insurance that they're actually going to pay for the transplant because the transplant's going to run a couple hundred thousand dollars. So once you do that, then you work the patient up, make sure that they have healthy kidneys, a healthy liver, healthy lungs, a healthy heart, to make sure that they can actually withstand the high doses of chemotherapy that are associated with the transplant procedure. Once all that's done, the patient has to have, if they're getting an allogeneic transplant, meaning a transplant from a donor, they have to have the donor identified. So is anyone in the um, transplant uh, registry? So basically now all you have to do, I used to have, when I signed up, they took some blood from you. Now all they do is they just swab your cheek and they can tell if your antigens match based on, on that. Um, but it's, it's tough to get donors. It's, you have, for every sibling that you have, you have about a 20 to 25% chance of them being a match. So I only have one brother, so uh, I'm pr probably out of luck if I were ever to need a, a bone marrow transplant because the likelihood is that he's not gonna be a match. So I would need to go out into the bone marrow transplant registry to see if I have a match that's unrelated. And doing an unrelated transplant that's a match versus a related transplant that's a match, unrelated transplants tend to have more complications such as worsening graft-versus-host disease. So all that said, you get that situated as far as the donor situation, all the logistics as far as the insurance, the work up ahead of time to make sure that the patient's healthy enough for the transplant. Then you bring them into the hospital and give them what we call conditioning chemotherapy. The conditioning chemotherapy are fatal doses of chemotherapy. The reason why they're fatal is the doses are high enough such that they will preclude the patient from recovering their own bone marrow function. So they wipe out, it's like Roundup. Anyone use Roundup to kill weeds in their yard? You kill all those cells and then they're done. They're not coming back, okay? And so you have to give cells to replace that. And those can be either your own cells, which is called an autologous transplant, that you collect those cells ahead of time and then freeze them and then reinfuse them after the chemotherapy, or you get a transplant from the donor. So 
Typically, for a transplant, there's one transplant where it, for multiple myeloma patients where it may be one or two days' worth of chemotherapy. Most of the rest of the transplants that patients get are going to get between three and five days' worth of chemotherapy. Then, usually one to two days later after the chemotherapy is completed, the patients get the transplant itself where they get the infusion of cells. It's not all that exciting. It's basically like a blood transfusion, okay? So uh, it's somewhat anticlimactic. We number the days in transplant. So the day of the transplant itself is day zero. So the days of chemotherapy are like minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two. Day zero is the transplant. And then after the transplant, it's day plus one, two, three, four. It's helpful to do it that way because it's a standard convention and you know to look for certain toxicities at certain time points after the transplant and certain complications and certain infections and all of that. So there are a number of different regimens that have been used to treat patients with transplant over the years. Originally, they treated patients just with high-dose radiation therapy. Uh, that's extraordinarily toxic, so that has been dialed back. And now a common regimen is to use a lower dose of radiation. It's still total body irradiation, so it's still pretty tough stuff to take. But it's lower than it used to be, and it's in combination with chemotherapy. And the most common chemotherapy uh, drug that's combined with radiation therapy is high doses of cyclophosphamide, typically two days of 60 milligram per kilogram per day. So that is a heck of a lot larger of a dose than what we give for breast cancer or for lymphoma or for any of the other malignancies that we use cyclophosphamide for. Also, there are other combinations of drugs that can be used in allogeneic stem cell transplant or even autologous stem cell transplant. Combinations with fludarabine and melphalan. Combinations with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Combinations with busulfan and cyclophosphamide. All of these have been used in the, over the years for different types of transplants for either leukemia or aplastic anemia or myeloma or relapsed lymphoma or relapsed leukemia. These are some specifics as far as the doses are concerned for the different regimens that have been used. Now, there is one little nuance that I want to share with you. Uh, with respect to the dosing of the chemotherapy that's given for transplant. When we talk about a full-on transplant that we've done for, you know, going on 40, 50 years now, those transplants are referred to as myeloablative. So the idea with a myeloablative transplant is you give huge doses of chemotherapy, the marrow is 100% obliterated, and then you have to replace that with your stem cell product, whether it's your own that you collect earlier or the stem cells from a donor. There is something now that has emerged over the last 20-ish years called non-myeloablative transplants, where they give chemotherapy at less intense doses, understanding that there's still going to be some residual marrow function from the recipient that hangs around, but you're still infusing allogeneic stem cells, and you expect those allogeneic stem cells to predominate. Okay, so the toxicities with non-myeloablative transplants where some of the, the stem cells still survive is less than the fully ablative transplant. So what are the common complications associated with stem cell transplantation? Uh, pretty much, you name it, it can happen. All right, the common toxicities, uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is quite common with the higher doses of chemotherapy that we use in this patient population. All of these patients are going to get some degree of mucositis. It just depends on how severe it is. It can range from just being bothersome uh, to where you give patients some of those uh, cocktails to swish and spit like Mary's Magic or Philadelphia mouthwash to the point where the mucositis is so devastating that the patients need to be on continuous infusion opioids for pain control, and even in some instances, patients have to be intubated. Uh, so fortunately, the more modern uh, conditioning chemotherapy regimens don't tend to cause that awful of mucositis where it requires intubation. But there's still a lot of patients that get fully myeloblative transplants that do require intravenous opioids continuously with PCA rescue. Other complications, we refer to them as regimen-related toxicities. So what are they? 
hepatic veno-occlusive disease. So that's a regimen-related toxicity to the liver. You can have idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, where basically you can get bleeding into the lungs. That's the secondary impact of the chemotherapy that the patients get. You can get kidney failure, depending on which particular chemotherapy drug that you use. If you use a nephrotoxic chemotherapy drug in the conditioning, you could be at risk for that. There are all sorts of infectious complications that patients can get. Bacterial, fungal, viral, fungal and viral, particularly in those patients that are on or that get an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Complications of graft-versus-host disease. Graft-versus-host disease is basically your new bone marrow, if you get a transplant from a donor, specifically your T cells, recognize the rest of your body as non-self, and so they attack it. So you can get real raging red skin rashes, you can get horrible gastrointestinal toxicity, and you can get liver failure as a result of severe graft-versus-host disease. And graft-versus-host disease is one of the real risks and potential for fatal events in patients that get an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And then, if you're fortunate enough to get through the interim period where you get through the risk period of infectious complications, you recover your blood cells, you don't get serious regimen-related toxicity, there are late complications of the transplant which are important to note. You can have a later form of graft-versus-host disease which involves other tissues besides the gut, the skin, and the liver. You can get, some patients get cataracts, uh, we have patients that get chronic lung disease. There's a, a whole host of uh, insidious toxicities that can manifest months to years after patients get transplanted, including secondary cancers. Now, this VOD stuff, how severe is this? Well, there was a, there was a study that looked to see how prevalent it was in you know, and it ranges depending on the case series that you look at in the literature. This, this particular study looked at how many of these patients are getting hepatic veno-occlusive disease that's termed to be uh, not as serious as compared to the severe VOD, and I'll get into the criteria of what separates that shortly. And basically, you're looking at about 5% of the folks getting VOD and another 3-ish percent of patients getting the severe manifestations of VOD. Now, what is it that happens in patients with hepatic veno-occlusive disease or VOD? What are some of the original or the initial clinical findings that you may have for a patient? Well, when it's going to happen, it typically happens within the first week or so after transplant. So I'm talking, you know, day zero, to day, 10, day plus 10 on average is, is when you're going to see it. Uh, it can occur later, but usually it's going to occur sooner because it's a direct effect of the cytotoxic chemotherapy's impact on the vasculature of the liver. What you're going to see is, not surprisingly, if it's toxic to the liver, you may see an increase in the total bilirubin. You may also start to see some weight gain in the patients because the patients are starting to develop ascites. Now, what is going on in the liver? What's going on in the liver is a direct injury to the vasculature induced by the chemotherapy, the huge doses of chemotherapy that the patients are exposed to during the conditioning chemotherapy. And what it does is it has basically um, a scalding type effect on the vasculature of the liver. So what does that mean? So this is just a representation of the vasculature in your liver, and those little green dots, those are, those are chemotherapy toxic particles. And they interact with the endothelium in the vasculature of the liver. And they damage the cells. And when they damage the cells, there's, there's some inflammation that starts to occur and release of inflammatory mediators. And then what happens is you start to get fibrin deposition. And when you get fibrin deposition, it not only uh, deposits on the vasculature endothelium itself, but also on some of the cells that are passing through there. And then you start to get a lot of traffic. So it'll be basically like going on 294 at 5 o'clock, okay? You start to see a little bit of a buildup of traffic and then a stop. Uh, so 
that's what happens here. And because of the buildup of the fibrin and all the cells and the vasculature in the liver, you get shunting of blood flow. And because you get shunting of blood flow, you get cells that become hypoxic in the liver. And because you have cells that become hypoxic, if they remain hypoxic, guess what happens to them? They die. So you basically have a, a liver that's starting to die from the inside out because of the lack of blood flow to all the areas of the liver. Now, are there any risk factors for VOD? And the answer to that is yes. There are certain uh, non-iatrogenic risk factors and then iatrogenic risk factors. So someone that has prior liver disease, for example, cirrhotic, they may be at risk. Uh, certain alkaloid uh, in the environment, there's a, there's a couple of rare alkaloids that have resulted in patients t ingesting large amounts of this stuff and getting a VOD-like uh, syndrome. But really what we're talking about is certain drugs that are associated with it and the transplant procedure itself. So there's a couple of monoclonal antibodies that are FDA approved for the treatment of acute leukemia. One is called inotuzumab ozogamycin, which is uh, FDA approved for the treatment of ALL. And then gemtuzumab ozogamycin, which we talked about a little bit ago, which is approved for AML. Those are both associated with an increased risk of VOD. Then the particular types of chemotherapy that you're using during transplant. So busulfan exposure. So we actually monitor pharmacokinetic drug levels of busulfan to try and minimize the chance of patients developing VOD. So you get 16 doses of busulfan during the transplant procedure. So you get serum concentrations after dose number one send it off to the lab to get it analyzed. By, typically by dose three or four, you get the results back, and then you can titrate the dose to a certain therapeutic range to try and minimize your risk of developing VOD because of high busulfan levels. Melphalan exposure is also at risk, places patients at risk for VOD and certain exposures to radiation therapy. And if you have the unfortunate circumstance of having to get a second transplant because of a severe leukemia that has undergone multiple relapses and you've relapsed following your initial transplant, if you're healthy enough and have a suitable donor for a second transplant, patients that get a second transplant, uh, there aren't many of them, but when they do, they're at risk for a lot of toxicity and VOD is high on the list. Now, there's been a number of uh, attempts to try and come up with clinical criteria for the diagnosis of VOD. There was kind of, it was kind of East Coast versus West Coast. So there was the Baltimore criteria, which was developed by the folks at Johns Hopkins. Seattle criteria, which were adopted by the folks at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute, uh, one of the largest stem cell transplant centers in the world. And basically they involved the following. An increasing total bilirubin, some degree of weight gain, or hepatomegaly and a couple of other factors. There's, a, there's been an attempt to try and uh, resolve that with the modified Seattle criteria, but if you're looking at someone that has a bilirubin that's increasing, that's gaining some weight, either has right upper quadrant pain or some sort of hepatomegaly on exam, you're looking for trouble for this diagnosis, unfortunately. Now, how do we know which patients are gonna do really, really bad? We don't know exactly for sure, but sometimes we have a hint. And the hints, or hints, I should say, tend to be how fast is the bilirubin going up? So if you see someone that has a bilirubin of 0.6 on day plus two, and then it goes to 0.9 to 1.7 to 2.8 to 3.2, if you see that, that trajectory shooting up in a hurry, and if you also see the patient continually gaining weight uh, and a substantial amount of weight, and I'm not just talking like 0.1, 2, or 3 kilos, I'm talking like a kilo per day or 0.8 kilos per day, you see that and it's consistent over a period of several days, those patients tend to be at highest risk for developing severe VOD, which involves multi-organ failure. And so the multi-organ failure that these patients typically are going to experience is, of course, the liver's number one, right? Because that's where the action's going on. But their kidneys are usually the second to go. And once both of those go, it's just a matter of time before they either go into cardiac compromise or pulmonary compromise. Now, management of VOD. How can we stop this? Uh, quite honestly, we haven't had a lot of tools. 
over the years, and it's been a very frustrating thing to watch patients go through this because of our limited ability to do anything about it. Uh, you do supportive things, so you remove all the hepatotoxic drugs, right? That's a no-brainer. You try to get a sense of their fluid balance and to, to diurese them appropriately, to, to remove any excess weight that they may be gaining. And since we know that there is a thrombotic element to the pathophysiology of VOD, it's been attempted over the years to try and give antithrombotic or anticoagulant therapy. So how well has it worked? Well, let me just say a good rule of thumb, and these are, these are a number of different case series that have looked at giving either TPA in conjunction with heparin or by itself in patients with hepatic venoocclusive disease. When you have a very low rate of response and the rate of toxic deaths is equal to that rate of response, it's generally considered that it's not a really effective therapy. So yes, there are some patients that who have appeared to gain benefit from TPA and heparin in the setting of VOD, but just as many patients are probably gonna die from bleeding. So most of the folks that take care of this patient group accept that TPA and heparin is not an acceptable therapeutic option for this patient group. Well, what else could we do? Well, is it possible to cut out the liver and give them a new one? Uh, believe it or not, that's been attempted. That's a very hard thing to do in someone that has just had a stem cell transplant. Uh, given that their counts haven't recovered yet, they're at risk, they're a huge risk for infection. God only knows what's going on with their malignancy that led them to transplant to begin with. We don't know if they're in remission. So there's a lot of issues in even considering and going down that road. We, at my institution, we've never done that. And believe me, it's not that the liver transplant guys wouldn't, because if you sit in the hallway for more than five minutes and you're not paying attention, you may turn around and your liver may be gone. So, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, a reasonable option, I think, for most patients. Then there's the possibility that you could actually do portal shunts. Uh, that has been employed at some institutions. There's some case series data out on that. But again, the risk of going in there and doing that manipulation in a patient that's severely thrombocytopenic perhaps still has significant mucositis as well as other things going on, the risk of infection, not too many uh, IR guys are going to want to do that. So I've, I think I've painted a pretty reasonable picture that the treatment options for this disease are limited, okay, and that we need some sort of new intervention for these patients. So if we're going to come up with a therapy, what would seem to work best? Well, number one is we have to come up with a therapy that can protect those endothelial cells from damage in the liver, right? Because we know that that's the primary driver of this disease. Uh, we want to give something that's not going to exacerbate the risk for relapse of the patient's primary cancer, right? Because we know that if they're at transplant, they already have some sort of bad cancer. So we know that these patients are susceptible to relapse, and we want to mitigate the risk of that. And then lastly, we want to give something that may be useful, hopefully, in other vascular-related injury that occurs in patients that go through transplant. So we know that patients that go through allogeneic stem cell transplant because of the immunosuppressive drugs they get, like cyclosporine or tacrolimus, those drugs induce TTP or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which is, a, which is a primarily a vascular injury disease. So if we could give something that would uh, help prevent that sort of complication, or at least not make it worse, that would be useful. And if there was something that would be helpful for graft versus host disease, that would be the cherry on the cake. So there's a compound which appears to do some of those things that's been around for a number of years. It's called defibrotide. And for many, many years, it was only available via a compassionate use protocol, and now it's, now it's commercially available. And there appears to be a couple ways in which this, this drug works. So number one, it appears to have some protective effect on endothelial cells, okay? And number two, it appears also to have an antifibrinolytic impact. Now, how exactly that does 
does those two things, it's not entirely clear. But those are the two mechanisms by which defibrotide appears to exert some therapeutic benefit in this patient group. So let's talk about some clinical trial data with this drug. So this is a treatment study. So this is in patients that have established VOD. And this is one of the more interesting phase three studies that I think I've kind of come across. It's, they, in, the, in the paper, they call it a phase three study, but it's kind of not really a phase three study because what they did is they treated patients that had established hepatic venoocclusive disease, um, and then they compared them to a smaller group of historical controls. So that's not really like a randomized phase three clinical trial that we typically think about, but nonetheless, it, it is what it is. And what they're trying to do in this study is they're trying to establish how many patients recover from VOD in the transplant setting. And so their definition of recovery or complete response is, does the bilirubin number normalized, meaning does it go down to less than two milligrams per deciliter? And if the patient has multi-organ failure, does it resolve? So those are the two things that we're looking at for success. And by, by way of background, difurbitide, it's, it's an IV therapy. It's typically, it's a, the dose is 25 milligram per kilogram. It has to be given in multiple uh, infusions per day. So what were the success rates? Well, let's start by talking over on the, your left-hand side of the screen. There we go, right there. Complete response. So what percentage of patients had their total bilirubin normalized and resolution of multi-organ failure? And it was 24% in those that got defibrotide. In those that were the historical controls, it was 10%. What percentage of patients had an overall survival at day plus 100? In the folks that got defibrotide, it was 38%. In those that were the historical controls, it was 25%. So this is the, the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Top curve is defibrotide. Bottom curve is the historical controls. Not a ton of patients, but when you compare this to any of the data that had ever been published with any other intervention in patients with hepatic venoocclusive disease, this was clearly better than anything we had ever had before. We have some evidence that suggests that defibrotide is useful in the treatment setting. Could it be useful in patients for prophylaxis? So the European Bone Marrow Transplant Consortium tried to look at that in pediatric patients. So what they did is they gave these folks, they randomized them either to defibrotide prophylaxis or not, given on the first day of chemotherapy administration up until day plus 30. This is the schema of the trial. So one of the things I'd like to point out is if the patient did develop VOD and they were on the control arm, they could cross over to get treatment with defibrotide in the hopes that they would be salvaged. So what were our results? Well, the rate of VOD in the patients that were just in the control arm was 20%. The rate of VOD in patients that got defibrotide prophylaxis was 12%, which was statistically significant. Now, uh, for, as I had mentioned in the beginning of the talk, defibrotide was available for a number of years ver through a compassionate use uh, pro program. So you had to call up the company, you had to file with the FDA in order to get the drug, and then the drug would be shipped to you and you'd be able to administer it to patients. So this particular data set actually looks at how those patients that were enrolled in the compassionate use availability of the drug did over time. And then they compared it with some of the other data that's out there. So if you look, this is the, this is the phase three-ish trial that I talked to you about earlier. So these are the patients that got defibrotide. This was the control arm. And then these are all the patients that were treated in the compassionate use protocol on study. And so there was approximately 300 of these folks, or I'm sorry, uh, 300 that got VOD 
and with multi-organ failure, another 250 or so that had no organ failure, and then the total amount was just over 500. So in terms of adverse events, uh, defibrotide is actually a remarkably well-tolerated compound. So in this instance, there's approximately 20 20-ish percent of patients that had some adverse event that was related to defibrotide. But in my experience in taking care of patients with this drug, the toxicities that the patients get are not related to the defibrotide. They're just toxicities of the transplant itself. So uh, I, I think a number of those toxicities that have been reported, they're, they're more like transplant-related toxicities, and they just got coded as a, as a defibrotide-related toxicity. So I think it's an it's a exceptionally safe compound to give patients. So again, to spell that out, look at these toxicities. Uh, what you're seeing is a drop in blood pressure. Could patients with VOD with multi-organ failure get a drop in blood pressure because their kidneys are failing? You bet they could. Respiratory failure, fevers, GI toxicity, pulmonary hemorrhage, GI bleeds. All this stuff is secondary to the transplant and complications thereof. Well, how did patients do in terms of survival? Well, the first analysis breaks it up into pediatric patients in this column and adult patients, okay? So the pediatric patients, the day plus 100, about 60% of patients were surviving when you look at all comers. And then when you look at patients that had multi-organ failure, that number drops down to half of patients. When you look at the adults, the survival is a little bit worse. It's just under half of patients when you look at all comers and about a third of patients when you look at the patients that had multi-organ failure. When you analyze the data comparing patients that got an autologous transplant, meaning their own cells, versus an allogeneic transplant, meaning a transplant from somebody else, this is not all that surprising. So the autologous transplant is this data over on the right-hand side. So about two-thirds of patients are able to survive, and even 60% of patients that had multi-organ failure are able to survive the complications with VOD when they get defibrotide. The numbers are worse with allotransplant. So out of all comers, only 50% survive, whereas about 40% with severe VOD survive. So it's not all that surprising that the allo patients do worse because they have other stuff going on. They're getting the immunosuppressants, which are toxic for graft-versus-host disease. They could have complications of graft-versus-host disease that contribute to their overall morbidity and mortality. And then when you look at everybody, so all comers, survival at day plus 100, 50-ish percent for all comers with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Those that had severe VOD, 45 percent. Now, if you think back to some of the historical data, for patients that have severe hepatic venoocclusive disease before the defibrotide era, they had an 80% mortality, okay? So now, with the defibrotide era, you're looking at an improvement of a 20% survival in the severe VOD group to a 45% survival in the VOD group. Now, I understand the limitations of the data. I understand that none of this is based on phase three randomized controlled data. It's just looking at all the patients that were treated on this treatment IND over time and comparing that to how patients had done before this drug was available. But nonetheless, that's a pretty striking difference. So we have some prospective data that suggests that defibrotide is helpful for prophylaxis in children that are at high risk for VOD, that are getting an allogeneic stem cell transplant. We have some evidence in adults that get de defibrotide for treatment, that it is useful in patients that have established VOD and can, it, that can decrease the morbidity and mortality overall in patients that get VOD during transplant and in those tougher to treat patients that have VOD associated with multi-organ failure. So we have a new compound, the first in its class to make an impact in this group of patients, 
that prior to this, we really had no meaningful uh, therapy to offer this patient group. So where are we going to go from here? Um, at my institution, we have implemented the use of prophylaxis on the pediatric side. I think the, the jury is still open as to whether or not prophylaxis will be useful in adult patients. We'll have to wait and see if, if, if the data makes itself available to support that. Um, I think it's too early to tell. I think we do need to look at defibrotide in use in combination with other therapy options. So if we have an, another drug that's being developed, I think if a drug shows promise, giving that in combination with defibrotide or coming up with some sort of overlap of therapy would be a wise thing to consider. Okay, thanks guys.